So it's a um, kind of overcast, chilly day today here, very atmospheric, and um, it feels appropriate because I wanted to go down a little rabbit hole with you guys talking about VC Andrews. So in my opinion, there's a particular gleam in the eye that people of a certain era get when you ask them if they remember VC Andrews. It's kind of a slightly, you know, chagrined delight or a memory of reading something adult at an age when it felt a little bit exciting and rebellious. And um, there's also a little bit of shyness about admitting how much they enjoyed something that is now considered um, a bit pulp, a bit trashy or problematic. And talking about these books, problematic is <laughs> kind of a key word. <laughs> so Virginia Andrews was a runaway bestseller, bestselling author in 1979 when Flowers in the Attic was published. So it's a dark gothic story of children kept secret in the attic of their grandparents' mansion in order that their mother may inherit the money they need to survive. So they are abused and deprived, create their own world with each other, and family secrets come to the surface amongst other themes. So I'm going to talk about that book more later on. Um, but Virginia Andrews' book was huge, and her books as a whole, after that one came out, uh, have sold 107 million copies um, worldwide and have been published for over four decades. And there's more than a dozen film adaptations. So, I mean, these books are still going strong. So V.C. Andrews' books were really early YA, young adult fiction. Their main characters are usually vulnerable but beautiful teenage girls or um, even a little bit younger the sort of tween age girls who are menaced by evil family members in gothic mansions. They dark fairy tales is probably a good way to describe them about sort of princessy characters kept in towers by wicked stepmother like family member. And there's often a love interest involved along the way. Um, not always. Sometimes the love interest was uh, a little bit transgressive. Um, but yeah, while the books were aimed at adults, there was not a specific market aimed at teenagers really at this time, um, or that was just starting to become a thing. In the 80s and 90s, that young adult audience was really being tapped and there was a lot of um, YA really came into its own and, and books for uh, middle grade readers and different things like that. So they really tapped that market a little bit later. So th these books kind of hit a market that publishers hadn't really realized was there yet. So you kind of had like older children's books or adults books. You know, there wasn't kind of that, that target. Um, so yeah, because of that, in fact, a lot of kids were reading these books. Sometimes girls, a friend of mine as young as 10 was reading V.C. Andrews, um, which is pretty wild. And the reason that's wild is because part of the popularity of these books lay in the darker, controversial themes that these books contained. So for social context, in the past, children um, that came forward with stories about family abuse and sexual abuse, they'd largely been dismissed as sort of imagining it or as a kind of storytelling. Um, but in the 70s, there were things like repressed memories uh, and things like that. And children's testimonies started to be taken seriously. People started to believe them. And this meant that at the time when V.C. Andrews books were hitting shelves, stories of family secrets, of abuse, child neglect, incest, were kind of on everybody's mind. This mindset would later go too far and led to events like the Satanic Panic, for example. And the repressed memories cases were proved to be um, false. So that kind of, there was a kind of hysteria around it, false convictions, that kind of thing. Um, but the American Respectable Family Unit was under attack and our friend VC was ready to gleefully exploit this. So she had figured out what would sell and was having fun creating these controversial stories. They were so controversial that some booksellers refused to carry her books claiming that they felt they exploited women. 
And um, But the 70s was also the era of the exploitation film, which is a movie genre that exploits the sort of edgy themes of the day with an eye often to being a bit salacious or promising um, viewing that's a bit transgressive. And I think V.C. Andrews' books, whilst there are dark fairy tales or southern gothic, they also kind of tap into this idea of kind of selling or exploiting exploitation basically they're not bad writing at least not early on but the drama is dialed up and they are definitely trying to be a little bit salacious so the marketing for these books was really really smart flowers in the attic was claimed to be based on a true story one that virginia had heard from a doctor who treated her once and the covers were really iconic Originally, they were generally uh, black with a primary color um, sort of splashed on there as well. And often there was a house or a building line drawing. And then a little window in the front cover frames a picture of a girl's face, sort of dramatically lit. And then when you open the cover, there's a family portrait of the creepy kind revealed. So this kind of cover was called a keyhole cover. And it felt very special and exciting at the time when books had these covers. Um, It was such a fun gimmick. And I think it's fallen out of use a little bit now in paperbacks. Um, But yeah, it worked really well for these books and for horror book covers of the era. These were not cheap to produce. This was kind of very much a new, uh, new marketing idea. I think it may have been invented for Flowers in the Attic, but it was um, being used in other, in horror fiction of the same era, the 70s and the 80s. So I can't say that that's definitely true, but I I have seen it claimed that VC was the first one to have this. Um, So yeah, they were not cheap to produce these covers, so with the keyhole. So they were a bit of a marketing gamble, but one that in this case paid off. The other marketing thing was that there was a lot of mystery and rumors surrounding the reclusive author herself, who was reluctant to be interviewed. And the story of her life is very interesting to me. So I'm going to get back, get into that a little bit later and tell you a little bit about what I learned about her. Um, But Flowers in the Attic has sold more than 40 million copies worldwide, and it was soon followed by more books. That book in particular was optioned for a movie which came out in 87, to which Wes Craven was originally attached, and it features a cameo of the author herself. And uh, as I mentioned before, you know, some booksellers wouldn't carry her books, but the books were frequently banned as well um, for the sex scenes, obscenity, um, that kind of thing. And that really made them more exciting and popular and um, made it kind of exciting to read them. (laughs) Sometimes they were shelved in the horror section in libraries because of their sort of gothic dark themes. There's a lot of damsels in distress being menaced in these books um, and they are relentlessly sort of one bad thing happening after the next. Um, But yeah, still today, her books are a marketing powerhouse. They are still in print and more are still being published all the time. And Lifetime makes many of her book series into popular TV movies. So they are very much still in, in, uh, in the public mind, shall we say. So Virginia Andrews had seven books published between 79 and 86. And 1986 is the year that she died. Her books were huge sellers. Um, And when she died, there were two half-finished books. So her family brought in ghostwriter Andrew Niederman, and he completed her two incomplete stories. These sold really well as well. And Niederman has gone on to write almost countless books under VC Andrew's name since. He is still writing them to this day. And he's also the author of a biography of V.C. Andrews, which is kind of an odd read. Um, But yeah, because of this, there are a lot of things that have become tropes of V.C. Andrews that Niederman has lifted from her original books and repeated um, sort of almost until almost until they're sort of almost meaningless or um, yeah. So there are motifs of her books. 
So generally speaking, if you pick up one of her books, they will be a family saga. Flowers in the Attic, for example, uh, is the first book in the Dollenganger series. So Dollenganger is the family's last name. And the second book in the series of these sagas, there's usually, I think, four or five. The second book often follows the children into adulthood, where they are further tortured by relentlessly horrible events. And then a later book will often follow on the life of the original heroine's child. And then the final book to come out will often be a prequel. This is not always the case, but um, the books always have a young, pretty heroine who usually has siblings and um, she often has some kind of creative talent. Um, Kathy in Flowers in the Attic is into drawing. Um, other characters will be into like music and different things, but they often have this sort of talent. And then generally speaking, there's often a wealthy family who they are related to and they live in a huge rambling house. And then the main character finds herself either taken to that house or she's born into that house. But either way, she is a prisoner of that place. So there are family secrets, often a sort of rags to riches story. And most iconically, there's usually a forbidden love story. This is often either between siblings who are attracted to each other or finding out that the parents are a little bit too closely related. Um, sometimes there is a sort of stalking kind of scenario and there's often um, rape is often Sexual assault is often a strong theme in these books, too. Yeah, so this theme of, of rape or sexual assault is generally treated a little bit casually in these books. It's sort of... I've heard people say different things about how they sort of interpret this. Um, but it's, it's problematic. <laughs> it's problematic that there is relationships between siblings or people closely related... And that's kind of treated in this very casual way. And I think it is intended to be shocking. And the same with the, the rape plot lines. So basically, the lead characters in these books go through horrible abuse, um, starvation, neglect, beatings, poisonings, incest. There is sometimes a murder involved. And no one really comes to save the heroine. She sort of has to figure things out and save herself. Um, and this is particularly dark because often one of her parents is present and is not um, stopping the abuse from happening. So it's dark stuff and it's generally put forward in a very salacious kind of way. To me, that feels very 70s, this kind of controversial, I don't know. Anyway, um, as the books have gone on, they've become increasingly far-fetched and hysterical, which oddly makes them more kind of trashy and fun because they're really kind of silly as they go on, um, but often with themes that are as serious as a heart attack. So they're kind of an odd phenomenon to describe, but I guess since Lifetime now makes the movie adaptations of them... <laughs> adaptations of them you may have some idea from that about what their target audience might be or the kind of what you're kind of getting into some of the more recent books like the shooting stars series have a different format and seem um, a little bit more aimed at a teen or young adult audience specifically um but yeah, some of the one of the latest series actually has vampires in it as well. So um, Andrew Niederman, I think, was trying to tap into the sort of Twilight generation at that point. Um, by that, I mean people who, you know, liked Twilight. <laughs> I don't know if there's... Twilight generation sounds like um, people who survived the Great War or something. I don't know. Anyway, it's an amazing marketing machine. Um, but yeah, so... V.C. Andrews' biography is very exciting. <laughs> in 2022, a biography came out called The Woman Beyond the Attic, and it was written by Virginia Andrews' biographer, uh, sorry, ghostwriter, Niederman. He is now a biographer as well. 
And I had to read it. In a way, I was really surprised by what I read. But that said, I can't 100% recommend the book itself. It's a little bit odd. So Niederman never actually met VC Andrews in person. He was approached by her publisher to complete the prequel to the Dollenganger series, Garden of Shadows, when Andrews had received a diagnosis and was not doing well. So he was considered because he wrote thrillers with female leads that shared some features with the author's books, but he'd never actually read any of her books himself at that point. So he knew about them, everybody did, but his biography of her comes from her papers that were left behind and her family stories, um, his impressions, which I kind of guess means there may be some family spin involved because she died in 86 and her books are books under her name are still being published today so her estate would be worth quite a lot of money so I'm just saying they're not going to allow anything too bad to be said about her or that might create a bias or whatever but anyway his obvious love and ad for admiration for her as a person and as a writer really comes through and I did really like that uh, my main issue with the book is that it wanders around a bit and doubles back. There's not really a clear timeline when you're reading it. And so at times it repeats itself or seems to foreshadow an event as if it's about to happen. And then that doesn't occur for like 10 years or something. So if you want to see some vitriol, <laughs> Goodreads really does not like this book. Um, yeah. So there's a, a kind of a common opinion that the ghostwriter and Virginia's family are really milking the deceased author's fame far beyond what is in good taste, uh, which is interesting to me because that means there's a sense of love and loyalty to Virginia, which is kind of touching. Like, obviously, her books have spoken to a lot of people, which is kind of cool. So to get to the author herself... Cleo Virginia Andrews was 59 when her first book came out. In publicity photos of her, she looks a little cheeky, a little tongue-in-cheek about her own work, and she has a very pretty, youthful look overall. Uh, yeah, so what you can't really see in most photos is that she has a disability and is confined to an upright type of wheelchair. So in the 70s, there was a lot less acceptance of the humanity and feelings of people with disabilities. And in an early interview with People magazine, according to the biography, Andrew's public persona was skewed from being a bright, charming person to being somebody to be sort of pitied or as a bit of a weirdo. Uh, and this led her to be very cautious and shy about interviews and meant that there was then a lot of mystery and conjecture about this writer who had written this dark bestseller but was really hard to sort of pin down. She seemed a bit... Basically, she was kind of painted as being like a recluse and a bit creepy. And then that kind of was something that then fed into the mystery around her and her books that the sort of marketing was able to pick up on. So Virginia Andrews did not want people to know how old she was, which made her a little bit secretive as well. She is quoted as pointing out that people always want to know how old you are so they can judge you. If you're young, you're less mature than them. If you're older, you're past it. And if you're the same age, well, okay. So as a 59-year-old woman in the 70s, though she really looked much younger than her age, there was certainly a lot of people ready to judge her. But I love this quote because I think this is so true today. People love to ask each other especially women, how old they are, and then they make a judgment about that. But I think what you should take from this is that there is no set age to take the world by storm. So write that best bestseller or whatever it is you have inside you that wants to be expressed. So Virginia Andrews was born in 1923 in the southern states of America. I forgot to write down which one. I do apologize. Um, she was a middle child with an older and a younger brother. Uh, but I have also seen it that she was the youngest. Um, so there's more of that Virginia Andrews obfuscation. Her mother, Lillian, was a hello girl. That is a telephone operator. 
and her father William was initially in the Navy, but Lillian made him get different work because he was away too much and he didn't make a lot of money. So it was, they didn't, uh, they were struggling as a family to survive on that. So Lillian is, was a strong woman, but was often thought of as controlling and too intense by her family. It's interesting to me that she was born into a conservative, born to a conservative religious father. And she used to sneak out to go to Navy dances and engaged in wild teenage behavior in what would have been um, the turn of the century or even the Victorian sort of era. And yet, in her marriage, she became like her father, ruling with a strong will and having definite rules and morals and basically being a person who ruled with an iron fist. And you can see a bit of that um, dowager type controlling character in V.C. Andrews' book. So she was obviously obviously dramatizing a lot, but kind of using that as a motif, which is interesting. So Virginia was a very pretty, vivacious child and a wonderfully bright kid. She was skipped ahead several grades, and because she was ahead of the class, she was often allowed to draw to fill in the time once her work was done. And her drawing was so advanced that some adults initially thought that her drawings were faked and made by an older person. So according to her biography, she was actually enrolled at age seven in junior college art classes with the other students being 19 year olds, 18 and 19 year olds. So later on, she was able to help support her family by working as a commercial artist. So commercial artists uh, create drawings and art for magazine advertisements and products and things like that. And I mean, that's still a job today, but the era that she was working in, you know, when you think of those old magazines and posters for products with all the sort of hand drawn or painted artworks, sort of, I don't know, almost the Norman Rockwell kind of drawings and artworks that you see in those old magazines. You don't see it as much anymore. It's more photography used now. Anyway, they were super popular and... Yeah, I just think that's a really interesting thing about her when you consider that this was a girl that was growing up in the 20s and the 30s. So it's very unusual. So from being the apple of her parents' eye and a very pretty and charming, vivacious girl, Andrews dreamed of becoming an actress initially, but her life was about to change. The Great Depression, a world war, and her father's death at age 57 were all tragic changes that came during the next decades of her life. But the most damaging was the illness that caused her disability at age 17. So there have been a few different stories told about this. Her mother sometimes put the story around that she was pushed down a flight of stairs by jealous high school girls. Neighbors are said to have said that she was beaten by her family severely. And Andrews herself sometimes told slightly conflicting stories to people that asked. But essentially, what happened was that she had an early onset type of arthritis. And treatments for it were not great in this era. And in fact, doctors often refused to believe that she was in pain at all. And they dismissed her as making up her illness entirely for a really long time, even after the pain from the arthritis grew so unbearable that she had to drop out of school. So I don't know if you've heard this, that was sarcasm, but um, often doctors don't believe women's own assessment of how much pain they're in. And it's, um, it's kind of a thing. So anyway, after an actual fall downstairs, she developed bone spurs that ended up throwing her spine out of alignment. So she had surgeries to correct those. And then one doctor placed her in a full body cast for like long months to correct this. But because the condition that she had was not fully understood, the body cast actually fused the bone spurs and her spine. So instead of having mobility when she came out of the cast, she would now be confined to a wheelchair for life. And um, she could sometimes walk with crutches, I think, according to the biography, but it's a little unclear. So because of the fused bones and spine, she was more or less sort of propped up in her chair. And all her books were actually written standing up because she couldn't sit. She could only um, stand or lie down, basically. 
So this was a turning point. So at this point, her relationship with her mother, Lillian, became really intense. Lillian was now a widow and she had no life skills with which to provide for a family. So Virginia sold her commercial art to support them. And they lived with various family members at different times. But Lillian was very ashamed of her daughter's disability. She seemed to think it was an affliction sent by God or some kind of sort of embarrassing thing. So she refused to let her daughter be seen in public. So in one way, Virginia was thrust into adulthood early by providing and being pushed up with those grades and all that kind of stuff. Um, so she was kind of an adult too soon. But then in another way, her life as a teenager ended too soon. And her develop was kind of like personal development was kind of frozen there because at 17, she went from being an extrovert to being um, hidden away. So her mother would allow her to sit outside only if she was sort of hidden in a corner of the porch. She was not allowed to have any friends, no socializing. And her mother made it clear that no one would ever want to marry her or date her, which is really horrible. Um, I don't think that that was strictly true in that time period. Uh, I think it may have been true that it would be difficult for her to marry. Um, there are certain times in history where I feel like that might have precluded precluded you from being married you might have been seen as unmarriageable but I kind of feel like in the era that Virginia was um living in I don't I feel like her I feel like her mom didn't want her to marry as opposed to her not having any one that might be interested in marrying her um but anyway she was very she's described as being very fun and cheerful and she, in letters and things, she talked about different flirtations that she had. So I think she could have married, um, given the chance. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I think the loss of her father must have been devastating. So he really encouraged her to read and shared books with her and talk to her about things and encouraged her. And her her mother had this rule that books were just clutter, so there could only be three books in the house at a time. So going from having freedom to not having her father, who was a bit of a buffer between her and her mother, and then, you know, not being allowed to have books and being a, a really intelligent person. And I mean, I can't even imagine. <laughs> like, that's horrifying to me. So it was obviously quite sad. And at times, Virginia was definitely depressed. Added to this, uh, Lillian controlled her adult daughter's meal times and bedtimes in minute detail as though she was a child. And this was the way it was her whole life. So she would even send her to her room as a punishment for real or imaginary infractions for her entire life. So at one point, they lived with a younger cousin, Pat, who is quoted in the biography. And she did not see Virginia as being a freak with a disability or something to be ashamed of or hidden away. And she started taking Virginia out on little outings, going to the mall, doing things with her. And Virginia's mood and vitality improved. And that caused her mother Lillian to lose it. So one night, Pat and Virginia were cozying up and having girl talk. And Lillian was so jealous, according to Pat, that she physically attacked her. And then Lillian took Virginia and left and would not allow any contact between the two of them again, intercepting any letters or calls. So Lillian seems determined to destroy any kind of normal life that Virginia may have had. And at this time, Pat asked Virginia how she coped and remained so sort of charming and playful in the face of this kind of relentless stuff. So Virginia told her that she pretended she was a princess trapped in a tower, kept prisoner by a wicked stepmother. And in the books that she actually wrote herself, she's really explored this idea and her represent representations of teenage inner life, the kind of the drama and the, um, the sort of self self-absorption. I mean, I don't mean that in a bad way, um, but she really draws that kind of the things that teenagers are preoccupied with and how they see the world. She draws that really well, as well as 
when you read her books, oh my gosh, the sense of being trapped in oppression, the endless tribulations, like you can kind of see where that comes from her own, her own life, her own experience. Um, so it's kind of amazing that she wrote anything. Later in life, when she was writing, her mother knew about it, but didn't seem to think much of it, which was a smart move. So by contacting writing agents and publishers behind her mother's back, the book was out before her mother could stop it. And the biography makes it unclear whether she read any of her daughter's books or if she was horrified by the darkness of the first one and stopped reading it. But either way, Niederman makes clear that Virginia knew what she was doing and writing the kinds of books that she wrote. So she read a lot of bestsellers and kind of knew what was selling well. And so she set out to use her intelligence to write something that was intended as a bestseller and in a way was not meant to be taken too seriously or to be sort of literary, but to be entertaining. Um, and when you see photos of her face with her sort of knowing smile and her friendly expression, I think it's quite likely that she was just having a bit of fun and maybe at her mother's expense a little bit because some of the controversial stuff in these books um, and the the shallowness of some of the grandmothers and mothers, you know, family secrets, that kind of thing. I mean, that kind of her mother would not have approved. So either way, when the book was out, Virginia was thrust into the limelight and she was a celebrity, basically. So no matter how much her mother glared at people and people did find her, find Lillian hovering around sort of odd and unfriendly and a bit weird. She was out there now. She was out in the public. So while she was very cautious about talking to reporters, there are a few carefully chosen interviews and she did embrace her fame. She did writers events, she traveled, she was wined and dined and a lot of things. So she was no shrinking violet. And um, I think that's wonderful. I love this because she'd wanted to be an actress and perform. And here she was with a cameo in a movie and she was being sought out and seen and she was having her work read. And um, yeah, she also, in letters and things, she seemed to have had some really enjoyable flirtations going on with some different different men, including a stockbroker and a lawyer. And um, her mother did try to put a stop to these romances. She actually seemed to have driven off the stockbroker. But um, I don't know. I mean, go Virginia Andrews, just living the best life, you know? She's awesome. So... I mean, she never wanted to be just an invalid with people talking down to her or patronizing her. She was a vibrant, funny, very feminine woman. She flirted. She made her own clothes and was always beautifully dressed. And she seemed to really play with the different stories about herself as well, telling slightly contradictory things to different outlets. And um, yeah. She made sure to not foreground her chair in any photographs. She didn't talk about her illness much so that that wouldn't be her whole identity or people wouldn't think that her books were some kind of fantasy of an unlived life. Um, yeah, so with her bold plot lines and themes, she could not be ignored anymore. So because her story, I keep saying so all the time. Because her stories were very dramatic and relentlessly sad, people often asked her what inspired her. And it seems like a lot of it was dramatic fan fantasy. Her life was very small and narrow, and her family were generally stable, loving people. And she said that sometimes she wished for a little bit of drama. So writing about these intense, cruel families was a bit of fantasy. Uh, I think she could certainly relate to being trapped and controlled like some of her characters, but they are not in any way directly her. She was aware of local gossip and things going on in other families, and she read the newspaper. So, as I mentioned above, there was a doctor who told her the story of his childhood, which inspired Flowers in the Attic, and the brother in Flowers in the Attic goes on to be a doctor, so that's a little nod to him. But also, she was quite moved by... Um, during the Great Depression, she read about 200,000 homeless children who were struggling to survive on the streets in that era, and that really stayed with her. They're like Hansel and Gretel abandoned in the woods, um, the children and the characters in her books. So a case of sort of write what you know and not sparing your characters. 
She made a ton of money for her and her family, and she was very smart about managing her own money, which I think is very cool. Um, she made sure her mother was provided for, and she refused to allow her brothers to take over and control her finances, which they tried to do a few times, apparently. I think that was really smart. Sadly, just a few short years after publication of her first book, Virginia Andrews was losing a struggle with breast cancer. So this is so tragic. She was finally able to blossom and live the life that she should have been destined for. But much like a lot of her characters, she was cut down again and again. And the titles of her book, according to the biography, are actually listed on the monument of her gravestone. Isn't that sad? So I know that her books are problematic now with the way they seem to romanticize incestuous relationships and and a lot of things. There's a lot of a lot of different themes in, in all the different books. And perhaps they do exploit women. You could certainly argue that. Um, they're definitely not books that I would gush about and be like, oh, they're amazing. Um, but after reading her biography, I really love her. <laughs> she seems like such a funny, vibrant little minx of a woman. Brilliantly smart, very feminine. And I feel a lot of compassion for her and her life. And... Um, yeah, I like the sense that I got that she was just writing books that were of that time, like very popular fiction, meant to entertain, meant to be a bit edgy. Um, she sort of wanted to shock people. And for a whole generation, maybe more, they were very entertaining. And for some, a sort of rite of passage, like something that your, you know, your older sibling might sort of, you know, your mother wouldn't want you to read or whatever. Um, so they're easy to dismiss, really. And yet they really have remained popular and in print for decades, which is, um, I mean, that's really something. So the books themselves, I have a couple of her books on my shelf. I read My Sweet Audrina uh, a few years back, and I have a really lovely old beaten up paperback copy of it on the shelf. It's a wild read and not in a good way. I don't know, it's about a little girl called Audrina whose hair is described as different colors depending on the light. And she lives in the middle of nowhere in a creepy house with her creepy family. And there's such a sense of disorientation in the book, which is intentional, but it, it's pretty cool, that, that aspect of it. But it adds this kind of odd air to the whole book. So Audrina's father is a creep who makes her sit in a rocking chair and tries to make her be like his first daughter, who is also called Audrina. And she's she's died. And the new Audrina can never live up to the original Audrina. So there's a lot in this book. It's classic Virginia Andrews. But if you've read this, you'll know that there's... I mean, there's so much going on in this book. I mean... A lot of these books that she wrote were about family secrets coming to light and that kind of thing. Um, but there's, they're really, there's a lot of toxic stuff in there. So there's uh, themes of rape in this book. There's a very toxic father-daughter relationship. Um, her later romantic relationship is sort of very not okay. <laughs> um, so that's my sweet Audrina. I wanted to go a little bit more in depth with her first book, Flowers in the Attic. So in 1979, Flowers in the Attic was published. It actually didn't get amazing reviews, but as I mentioned above, the marketing was really smart. So what the publisher did was get it into the hands of readers and booksellers and those kinds of people and created a word of mouth as well as using that keyhole cover gimmick and the distinctive cover art. And by the time the book got bad reviews from serious critics, it was already selling like hot, hot cakes. So those critic reviews really didn't matter. Um, yeah, and what really drew people was just the sort of shocking, controversial themes and this idea that it was a true story that you were sort of reading. And then a little bit of mystery, the way Virginia Andrews was very private. That was useful to the marketing machine as well, as I said. Um, yeah, so there was this kind of sense of mystery, salaciousness, the book was being banned, all of that kind of stuff. So it was a pretty exciting publishing phenomenon. So Flowers in the Attic is the story of 12-year-old Kathy. She's 12-year-old at the start of the book. Uh, Kathy Dollinganger, 
who is her handsome father's favorite child. When he dies suddenly, she, her older brother Chris, and their twin younger siblings are taken by their mother to her ancestral home called Foxworth. It's the 50s, and her mother has no life skills, no way of earning money to raise them and keep a roof over their heads. But she tells them that her father, their grandfather, is loaded. She says that he disowned her because she married against his wishes and that she needs to win back his love. But to do this, she needs to hide that she had any children. She says that this will be just for one night or a couple of nights, and she spins them a story of unimaginable wealth that she will inherit. And because of that wealth, they'll be able to fill, fulfill all their dreams. And But almost immediately, as soon as they get there, the kids are told that it's going to be more than one night that they have to stay hidden up in the attic, where no one will know they're there. So they meet their iron-willed grandmother, who soon lets them know that she hates them because their father was their mother's half-uncle, which makes them the children of an incestuous marriage. So they're a devil spawn, basically. She is strictly religious, hopelessly cruel, and throughout the book, though her name is actually Olivia, they refer to her as the grandmother, like a character in a fairy tale. So the use of the the in front of grandmother each time also creates a sense of her sort of at one remove from them. The grandmother, not our grandmother. So... She's a cruel keeper, and as the days in the attic turn into weeks and then years, the children cling together, making paper flowers in the attic to make it more cheerful, make it seem like a garden because they can't go outside, and they try to create a little world for themselves in the dark and the dust. So from coming to see them daily, their mother slowly comes to see them less and less, and after a while, barely at all, while the grandmother moves between ignoring them to spying on them and trying to catch them breaking one of her rules. The mother locking her children in the attic and leaving them at the mercy of their abusive, hell and brimstone religious grandmother is bad enough, but it gets worse. The, that's the VC Andrews guarantee. It's always going to get worse. <laughs> This book has so much dark and weird stuff in it, mixed in with the coming of age drama and teenage angst. There's death, grief, child abuse, beatings, incest, neglect, starvation, twisted religion, sickness, murder, sex, and periods are talked about. Periods. You didn't really get that in books much, although, yeah, I mean, it was very controversial to talk about periods. I think it's still controversial to talk about periods. Um, so yeah, this at the time was considered not nice stuff to talk about. Now that's just the kind of stuff that you see on an HBO TV show, but it still feels shocking when you read it, I think, because it attacks that core place of safety that children have and that we all relate to. So home and family, but more specifically our mothers who are supposed to be super nurturing, you know? and to put themselves second for their children. So I remember first reading this book years ago when I was probably about 13. Um, more recently, I was happy to find a stack of the vintage paperbacks of these at my local thrift store, which is basically where you will find these in the wild. They are not rare books at all. Um, yeah, and I reread this book for this video. And yeah, I think this one may be V.C. Andrews' best book, or maybe it's her most idiosyncratic. But um, yeah, if you have a favorite of hers that you like better, uh, let me know in the comments, because I'm really interested. All the elements are there that would later become tropes of her ghost-written series. And I guess the most obvious thing about it is that it has a very 70s feel to it. And it, it definitely feels like it's aiming to be a bit shocking and dark. So there's that. But it's also very readable. I read it in one night and I have to say I was hooked and interested the whole time. It's horrible, but sort of in a great way. I don't know. I love the huge gothic mansion of Foxworth that they're kept in. The attic is very creepy with its dark corners and cobwebs that like the light never fully reaches. And they sometimes have to keep quiet and um, not make any sound and, and that kind of thing. It's very gothic fiction-esque. Or I guess it is just gothic fiction, really. <laughs> um, but the book creates a really wonderful sense of claustrophobia. You can feel the walls closing in. 
And the way they make the paper flowers and try to make things fun for the twins and sort of shelter the twins from the truth because they're a little bit younger, it's so tragic. And the way they're stunted by the lack of light and lack of nutrition, lack of space, lack of social interaction, it's so cruel and unusual. At a later point in the book, without giving too much away, the older children find out about a room in the mansion that they're not um, they're not supposed to go or be able to go into the rest of the mansion. Um, but they find out about a room in the mansion that has this swan bed. And it's this sort of dreamlike Hollywood bedroom in this gothic house. And it's so intriguing. I wondered if the swan bed in She Done Him Wrong, that movie, was the inspiration for this bed. Um, sounds pretty fabulous, actually. But it's just really creepy because it's so out of place in the style of the house as a whole. So Kathy is our lead character, really. She can be a bit insipid sometimes, and Chris can be very sort of strident or kind of annoying. But I do think they really portray how boys and girls were sort of raised or expected to behave in that era. And I don't think it matters too much because the plot is driving us along so well as we're reading. Um, There are some uneven moments in the book, but it's a really incredible debut novel. The foreshadowing is masterful and used so well. Uh, the plot ticks along nicely. And there are plenty of little hopeful things that happen, only to have all hope dashed a couple of pages later. Uh, horrible things that the grandmother does, seemingly just out of spite. And there are plenty of twisted family secrets about the Foxworths that drop. Uh, and also hints there's sort of hints that there are things that we don't know kind of that would come out in later books in the series. Uh, it's very melodramatic and shocking. It's good fun, really, in a way. Uh, but yeah, the ending has a big twist in it that, I mean, I remembered from reading it before, but I mean, that must have been a really shocking ending on first reading the book. So I was surprised when I was reading it this time to feel a little bit more sympathetic towards the mother. When I read it as a teen, I felt like the mother was horrifically shallow and had more intent the whole time. Uh, I still think she is shallow, but I understand more the dynamic that created her personality. So she has no life skills and she has lost the one person who built her up, which was her husband, the one person who loved her. When she returns home to Foxworth, she kind of falls back into her old, her old role in the family, which people do with their families, and more frequently with an abusive family of origin, they do. They Her parents even beat her like a naughty child, even though she's a grown woman, shaming her and re-exerting their power position over her. While falling for her half-uncle is incestuous and pretty gross, and I mean, what is a half uncle, by the way? Does that make it better or worse? Uh, but yeah, even though she falls for him and elopes, what I realized this time around is that she has no friends outside the family home. And we get the impression that her father was grooming her. He definitely has an unnatural relationship with her. And that family dynamic is really off. Is really, really off. So she's not less awful in what she does for all of that. But she's a more well-realized character and she's actually quite well-written, really. So when you read it now, in a world where we talk about toxic families and narcissism and things like that all the time, and we understand this a bit more, she seems like she may be some kind of narcissistic person, as we would recognize it now, created by the family she grew up in. The way that she sees herself as a victim sort of doing what's best for her children in her own mind is really nicely done. She buys them expensive toys, but then gets annoyed when they complain about the cold because there's no insulation in the attic. She wants them to be excited for her going on little boating expeditions with friends, but she doesn't really care about how being locked up is affecting them. So she has no empathy with which to imagine what it must be like for them. I also liked that VC Andrews showed that because Chris was closer to and idolized his mother, he made excuses or didn't see through her lies as fast as Kathy does. It's a complex relationship of loving a parent that hurts you and how they react, those two children react to that in different ways and have different levels of denial about it. This was really well written. 
Um, at some point, Kathy starts to wonder why their mother has money for things like clothes, toys, and books, but can't just sell something so they can leave the attic and sort of, you know, get some money together and live their life. And then Chris gets annoyed with at Kathy because her questioning their mom means that the mom won't visit them as much. And that's that's very not okay as a dynamic. So on the whole, I could almost recommend this book. It's a bit dated, problematic for sure. Um, but I really remembered or expected it to be darker than it was. I think My Sweet Audrina is arguably more twisted as a story. And reading it now, it's nothing compared to like the average HBO show. Uh, it's a bit depressing maybe, but it's a real page turner and it was a huge phenomenon in its own era and, and ushered in a lot of um, other other books and sort of, you know, talking about these kinds of themes, which makes it an interesting cultural touch point in a way. So as the VC Andrews machine pumps out more books and tries different formats to stay relevant and making sales, it's definitely jumped the shark in some ways, with a ghostwritten series about vampires that I mentioned before being an obvious example, or maybe my favorite example. It's easy to be cynical and a little bit wry about all this, and you probably should be. The very first book was intended as a melodrama, intended to be a bestseller, intended to be controversial, and none of it is really meant to be taken too seriously, uh, even though when you read it, it kind of seems like it is. And it always pays to be a bit circumspect about shameless cash-ins. Most of the books with her name on them are pulp trash, and yet, I don't know, there's something a bit fun about trash and pulp culture, pop culture in my opinion. I think the books that she wrote herself are genuinely the best of the bunch. But the thing that I took away from all of this was just seeing these with fresh eyes. I have the feeling that I would really like VC Andrews if I met her or had met her in person. Her biography and the way her family talks about her. She was whip smart, creative, funny, outgoing. She's sort of in on the jokes about her books to some extent. She was playful and cheeky. And she managed to cope with living through all kinds of difficulties and trials in her own life, much like her heroines, though, you know, less dramatically, perhaps. She had a mother who, whether out of shame or a controlling nature, ended up stifling her. But it's also clear that her mother loved her as well. And she didn't let that stop her in the last years of her life. She was really able to shine, which is really cool. I think she's a cool person and I see her work a little bit differently now. So the books that she personally wrote are Flowers in the Attic, Petals on the Wind, If There Be Thorns, My Sweet Audrina, Seeds of Yesterday, Heaven, and Dark Angel. So all the Dollinganger series, I'm pretty sure, are her. Garden of Shadows and Fallen Hearts were incomplete and finished by Andrew Niederman. Um, yeah, so Garden of Shadows uh, is the, the prequel, I think, to the Dollinganger series. Um, but yeah, so those two were finished by Andrew Niederman. They read like Virginia Andrews, in my opinion. Anything written after 1988 were written by him solely, but under license and inspired by her work. Uh, they're all still in print. You can find some of the originals uh, with the little keyhole covers. You can find those um, paperbacks at a lot of thrift stores. Um, the original 1987 movie of Flowers in the Attic has her cameo appearance. She is a maid seen in a window. And I watched it. It's quite good if you want to seek it out. It tones down some of the more controversial themes. Um, but they're the lifetime movies of her books. And they have some pretty great actors in them, actually. Ellen Burstyn is in one of them. Um, Heather Graham. Um, a bunch of people. So... While they're a little bit TV movie-esque, they're actually a good watch in a Lifetime movie kind of way. And that's not me casting any shade. Um, I think Lifetime movies can be quite fun. So if you've made it this far with me, let me know in the comments how old you were when you first read VC Andrews and if you were scarred for life or if you have a favorite book or a series um, in this line, one you particularly hate, um, I'd just love to know what your experience with these books are, whether it's good or bad or or whatever. 
Um, something that I noticed when I talked to my friends about this was that they remembered liking them when they were younger, liking these books, and then they were shocked on rereading by how problematic the sexual aspects of these books are. Um, and they were sort of like, I can't believe I read this, I can't believe an aunt gave me this book to read, like that kind of thing. And for me, I often forgot the problematic aspects until rereading re them as well. So I kind of wonder if any of you guys feel the same way. But yeah, that is it for now. Thank you for coming on this dark little journey with me into the world of VC Andrews. Um, I hope you guys are all <laughs> okay after talking about that stuff. Um, yeah, thank you for watching. You can check out some of my other videos. I also have another channel and social, so you can find links below if you want more of that. And if you want to hang out again, remember to like and subscribe. And you can always leave a comment. Let me know what you thought or let me know what else you might want to see. Thank you.